So we've been going through the book of Daniel, and we've mostly been exploring how God's been faithful to these exiles from Jerusalem who have resolved within their hearts that they're going to be faithful Israelites, even though God had allowed uh, Jerusalem and their nation to be captured, his temple to be ransacked, uh, that they, they resolved to be faithful in the midst of this pagan nation. Uh, where they were forced to change their names and to learn this culture and spend three years studying the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And, and God has been faithful to them, that they've been given great favor and promotion in the midst of their experience there. And I think today we're going to begin to see some of the fruit and, and purpose of why God would allow his own people to experience such difficulty and, and even tragedy that he loves and cares for even these wicked pagan kings that happen to be ruling over them at times. And so we're going to be picking up in Daniel chapter 4 as we're addressing the, the beast of, of human pride. And this one is seemingly written by King Nebuchadnezzar. And so he's the pagan king that has been uh, making demands and giving promotion and slowly been discovering who who the actual creator and God of all the universe is. So he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Now this is actually, this almost sounds like the opening of a letter from the Apostle Paul. It's kind of interesting. He says, it has seemed good to me to show you the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Right? And so, like, this is kind of amazing that he's going out of his way to say these things. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So this is the big point that he wants us all to take home. He's come to the conclusion that even though he is this mighty emperor, this king, who's conquered nations, that rules over a great domain, he realizes that his own kingdom is going to come to an end and that there is a good king, a just king, a holy king, and, and God is the one who is all-powerful and his kingdom is going to last forever. Now, how does a prideful king to come to this conclusion? Well, it, it's not easy. and We're going to find out today how that happened. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease and prospering in my palace, right? And oftentimes when we experience seasons of prosperity, those are the moments in which we are least likely perhaps to be thinking about God and his work in our lives, right? Unless we've significantly captured our own hearts and, and given it to focus on gratitude towards the Lord, right? We can just be like, life's so good, like I don't have any you know, prayer requests, anything I need to bring before God. And so he's at this moment in his life where his kingdom is flourishing. And he's just prospering and, and resting. He's not even having, a, having to, to fight for it anymore. He says, I saw a dream that made me afraid as I lay in bed. The fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. And so God's giving him this dream that's going to upset the ease that he's experiencing. He says, so I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. It seems like this is somewhat of a common occurrence, but it seems like it's actually happen happening over a number of years. But he's like, all right, he's got this dream, he's unsettled by it, and he needs to know what it's about. And so it says, then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream. He at least cut them that slack this time. He's not asking them to tell him the dream and the interpretation. He says, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God. And so seemingly, perhaps Nebuchadnezzar still has a divided loyalty while he's recognizing some things that are true about God, he still is perhaps just adding God to the pantheon of all these other gods that he's already had. And he, he's, he's speaking of Daniel, and it's interesting that he is willing to give Daniel, refer to Daniel 
in his Hebrew name that gives glory to Jehovah, the one true God. And so he says, so at least at, at last Daniel came in and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods and I told him the dream. And so one of the things he's recognized, not perfectly accurately, but he notices about Daniel, there's something different about this guy, that the spirit of the holy gods, he says plural, is in Daniel. And so he doesn't have it all right, but he knows something is different about Daniel. And this is something that we might hope that even though the world might not fully understand uh, who we are and what we're about as followers of Jesus, hopefully, at minimum, they're noticing something distinct and different, that we are a, a holy people and that the Spirit of God is at work within us. He says, the, the dream, he says, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the Spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw uh, and their interpretation. He says, the visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached the heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. And so he has this vision and he uses this phrase that Jesus ends up using later on in one of his parables describing the kingdom of heaven being like a mustard seed that is planted that grows up into this great tree that the birds of the air, the birds of the heaven are able to rest in it. And so perhaps this tree that Nebuchadnezzar is seeing in his dream maybe is connected to a kingdom, not the kingdom of heaven seemingly that Jesus talks about, but maybe it's, maybe it's something related to that. He says, I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold, a watcher, a holy one came down from heaven. And so this wording is actually interesting, right? He's describing essentially an angel of the Lord coming to visit him. But the phrase watcher actually harkens back to the Genesis 6 account and the sons of God and the daughters of men and the Nephilim and that whole story. I'll let you explore that on your own. But this phrase watcher is actually also found describing that event in a non-canonical book. It's not a part of the scriptures, but what's called the Book of Enoch, describing these spiritual beings, these watchers, seeing the things uh, that God does to judge these fallen angels and the wicked deeds that they had done, that simultaneously there seems to be a fall within the spiritual realm as well as a fall amongst humanity as we had sinned against our creator. But nonetheless, this spiritual being a good one, right, comes down with a message. Verse 14, he proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. And so let him, and so now it's actually describing him, that the tree or perhaps the stump is a person and not a kingdom. And so perhaps the stump or tree is not the kingdom, but a, a king within a kingdom. So it says, let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given him and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets it over the lowliest of men. And so God seemingly gives Nebuchadnezzar this dream. He doesn't yet know all of the meaning, but the message within the dream is that this is going to be for the purpose 
that the living, that humans would know that God is the one who rules over the kingdoms of men and that he is even able to give a kingdom that is great like Babylon to the lowliest of men. And so this is kind of a peculiar message that God is not one who merely interacts and reveals himself to those who are even seeking him necessarily or to those who are followers, right? But he's even revealing himself to the nations of the world through some of his actions. It reminds me of his intentions through even the Exodus story. And there's a handful of examples of the many in which Right? Some of his actions, it says, speaking to Pharaoh, that the Egyptians should know that I am the Lord, that God would act in such a way or, or reveal a plague demonstrating his might against their own gods. Or in Exodus 8.10, so that you might know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Or in Exodus 9.14, so that you might know that there is none like me in all the earth. That God sometimes acts in such a way in order to reveal who he is and to knock us off our own thrones or to topple the idols that we have built up and worship. And that seems to be what God is going to be doing with Nebuchadnezzar. And so verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And so Daniel has this moment to think. Now, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not maybe the interpretation was a little bit more plain than the previous experience, and perhaps it's just that the wise men, the magicians, the Chaldeans didn't really want to tell him the meaning of the dream because, I mean, the, message, the messenger in the dream kind of, kind of communicates a little bit about what this is about and, and what God is trying to do. And so Daniel has a moment to think about this, and it says that he is, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed within him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. And so like Daniel might be pondering like, okay, what do I do in this moment? This is really unsettling. I know that God's going to have me and my, my companions here for up to 70 years in exile in Babylon. And, and I know they've already tried to kill me and my friends <laughs> a couple of times. Like, am I willing to say what I believe is the meaning of this dream? And yet Nebuchadnezzar himself alarmed is demanding, he's like, Daniel, you need to tell me this dream. You, I need you to tell me what this is, regardless of what you're feeling right now. And so Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. Now, I'm, I'm curious whether or not this was just simple like flattery, right? Just kind words or trying to like appease a potentially angry king or if whether through time, Daniel did in some way become friendly with this pagan king as he's living a life, right? Still devoted, uh, holy as unto God, but he's like, he's come alongside this man and he's like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you to some degree. And he's already seen God reveal certain things to him. And Nebuchadnezzar wants the dream to be interpreted to him, even if it seems to be bad news. It reminds me of a story in 1 Samuel 3 when young Samuel is given a vision from the Lord about the death of Eli, the prophet's sons, and Eli himself, and the fact that God is going to allow the Ark of the Covenant to be handed into the, the hands of the Philistines. And Eli, this young kid who gets a vision, a dream from the Lord, is kind of scared. He doesn't want to tell Eli what's, what's about to happen. And so Eli ends up telling him, he says, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me that, of all that he has told you. And so Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli says, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And so it's an aspect of some degree of character if someone's wanting to know the truth, even if it might seemingly be bad news 
or offensive to them. And so Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what is the meaning of this dream, and now Daniel's going to tell him. Verse 20, uh, he says, The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached the heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Those whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which food was for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived, it is you, O king. Right? You are the tree who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. Right? And so God, through this vision, is acknowledging, Nebuchadnezzar, you have grown mighty. Right? Your empire is the most powerful on the earth in this moment. And you've experienced and achieved greatness. At verse 23, And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down, a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. He says, this is the interpretation. O king, it is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, you shall be wet with the dew of the heaven and seven periods of time, most likely seven years, shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed, that is to be given back to you for uh, for. Uh, for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. And so God has communicated this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. It's upset him. It's left him dismayed. And now Daniel tells him the meaning of this dream, that while his kingdom has grown great, God is allowing it to be cut down, and Nebuchadnezzar seemingly is going to live losing his mind for seven years, and God will give it back to him. And all of this is for the express purpose that he would know that the kingdom of men is under the domain of the Most High God, and he's the one who gives it to to whom he wills. And so what I think about this is, well, the dream has just been given, and the interpretation just said, Nebuchadnezzar could probably repeat this and just be like, okay, yeah, uh, Most High rules over the kingdoms of the earth. He gives it to who whom he wills. Like he could have communicated this to some degree. He has some knowledge how to say those words, but it seems as though it's going to need to be experientially known by Nebuchadnezzar. That while he can understand the logic of what's being communicated, he doesn't act on that knowledge. He doesn't have the wisdom to apply it. That it's possible to know something and say, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. But oftentimes, even we as believers, we can be equipped with a a lot of biblical knowledge as we grow in our study of the scriptures, as we grow alongside other believers and, and grow from their wisdom. And often, the same words of God that we have read many times can become drastically deeper in meaning when we finally go through an experience in which we have to apply it. Now, I want to suggest that it is worth studying the scriptures before we need to apply it. That while there is this experiential knowledge, different from just like a a mental knowledge and understanding, I'm not saying completely discard the other. Because oftentimes in studying the word of God, it equips us for every good work that he's called us to do. That we want to be prepared for whatever temptation we might face. That we want to be ready to respond with compassion or humility Right, whenever we encounter those in the world, that we have a reason for the hope that is in us. But at the same time, I want to suggest that there will always be something that we face, likely a different thing for each of us, in which even though we might be familiar with the scriptures on the topic, we won't 
really learn it until we experience it. And that was seemingly the case with King Nebuchadnezzar, that he's going, even after having this dream and hearing his friend Daniel give the interpretation, he's going to have to go through seven years of time in which his mind is lost and he comes to the conclusion that God is the one who rules over all the world. And what's interesting here is it's not that he has to be incredibly intelligent to understand this because in the moment when it's revealed to him, he'll have the mind of a beast seemingly, right? And, and so it's not about having an intelligent mind, it's about having a humble heart is what he's going to need. And now, now Daniel goes a little bit off the script and he, he ends up giving some of his own counsel here. He says, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. And so Daniel's bravely giving this recommendation and he's basically saying, you need to repent. You need to change your mind. You need to turn from living life your own way. You need to break off from your sins, separate yourself from them, and then do that in two ways, right? Practicing righteousness, live holy before God when it's just you and him, and then also to love your neighbor, to show mercy and compassion on those who are oppressed, many who were oppressed by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And then I, I really, I really like this, where he says, there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity, right? That's not the prosperity gospel there, but I think it's an accurate representation of how we encounter God and, and often his promises that in living right before God, it might be the case that God blesses you physically, right? That God blesses you with material goods. It might be the case that that happens, but it's a, it's a might be. There may perhaps be that sort of experience that we encounter. But at the same time, as far as the breaking off of our sins and living wisely, we can avoid much needless suffering when we choose to do things the right way. And so this isn't like a guarantee of like, hey, you just do what's right and your life is going to go wonderful for you, right? Because in some instances, those who do that experience martyrdom and suffering, all right? In just the last chapter, his friends almost got killed for staying true to their faith. And if not that example, there are examples of many in the scriptures who are killed for their faith in Christ. And so I, I like the idea that Daniel is honestly conveying, sometimes God blesses you in this world, and even if not, he still blesses you when you still choose to do things his way. It just might not be expressed in the physical prosperity that King Nebuchadnezzar would have been used to. And so, so David ends up recognizing that the, this dream that the king has had is a warning with hope of repentance. That there's this warning dream that's been given and the reason that God's given it to him before he experiences the discipline that he's about to is because he has a chance to respond now. That he's a chance to do the right thing now. And so Daniel's like, listen, this is what I would recommend for you. Get your heart right with God now rather than having to go through this. But sadly, that's not what happens with Nebuchadnezzar. It says, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. And so sadly, even with the warning, even with the dream, even with the, the counsel of a wise friend, he still had this prideful heart, right? He, he, he heard all of what he needed to know, but he still had this heart inside of him that was not humbled before the Lord. And while he's on his palace roof, the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of of my majesty, right? So he's on his palace, he sees his city, he knows he's conquered all of these kingdoms and, and he starts just to himself seemingly boasting in who he is and what he's done. And so he still has this heart 
of pride. I think a way that we can overcome that kind of heart is to have gratitude before the Lord. Right? Oftentimes, I'll walk around my house, not saying that, right? but just being like, God, I'm so grateful. I can't believe you've given me this. I can't, I can't believe you blessed me like this. And, and I think that having a heart of gratitude can deliver us from that, that level of pride. I think it's also helpful to recognize in the scripture that God is the one who gives our hand the power to obtain wealth, it says in Deuteronomy. Right, recognizing that our own accomplishments, that all of those gifts and skills and strength were sourced from God to begin with. And so we still can't boast about who we are. And so it's, it's, it's right for us to be grateful to the Lord, to be thankful to the Lord, to obey the Lord even with the things that he's given us. Right, to think about if God has blessed us abundantly, if he were to ask, like he did of the rich young ruler, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me, would we be willing to walk away from it? Right? Or, or would we be willing to put it aside in order to follow Jesus? And so King Nebuchadnezzar says this, boasting in himself, and while the words were still in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with dew, of heaven until his hair grew as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. And so there's this warning and now this discipline because he did not heed the warning. And he ends up living like this beast out of his mind for seven years. Peculiarly, there's a word for this. It's called boanthropy. It's a psychological disorder in which someone believes themselves to be a bovine, and it's often connected with schizophrenia or hallucination. I understand you might not believe this, but I happen to know someone who had a very bad experience with hallucinogenic mushrooms, and even after that high wore off for many days, experienced something weirdly similar to this. And they were fortunately delivered from that, and they're faithfully following the Lord this day. All right, so it's like, I, I wouldn't believe that story probably either <laughs> if I told you. But nonetheless, it's this thing that even secular culture recognizes that people have encountered and endured. But either way, if you want to just chalk it up to Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind, that's fine. And so in verse 34, what does he say? It says, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. That he comes to his senses. It took seven years for that to occur. It reminds me of the story of the prodigal son in which he's hungry and starving and it spent all of his inheritance on frivolous living, sinful living, and he's now feeding pigs and he's thinking about eating the pods that are fed to the pigs because no one's giving him anything. And he comes to his senses. He comes to his senses and remembers that he could go back to his father's house and acknowledge that he had sinned before heaven and before his father and his father does end up welcoming him back. So it reminds me of that moment where Nebuchadnezzar lifts up his eyes to heaven. It's this, the sequence seems important that I don't know if it took seven years for him to be humbled or if that was just like a built-in part of the discipline, but he lifts his eyes up to heaven and that's when his reason returned to him. Similar to the idea of the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that reason and wisdom come back to him in this moment. And so he praises, he praises God. And he says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. 
All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And so he experiences this knowledge now. He understands that God is in control of everything and that he doesn't get to tell God, no, I don't think you should do that right now, or I'm going to do it my way instead, that Nebuchadnezzar experiences this wisdom. Of God, he recognizes that he is everlasting in his dominion. He has an enduring kingdom and that God can do whatever he wills. And of humans, he recognizes that even powerful humans are accounted as nothing, that, that the greatest of humans can still do nothing apart from God. Right? It reminds me of Paul's words in Acts 17 where he says that God is the one who made the world and everything in it, and he is the one who gives life and breath and everything to us. Right? That we are all completely dependent on him. Now, while he says that humans are accounted as nothing, I want to suggest that the scriptures also communicate that we are still tremendously valuable in the sight of the Lord, that we have been made in the image of God, that God even in this account cares for those who are oppressed, these human beings that are being mistreated by others and wants Nebuchadnezzar to show them mercy, and that Christ himself was willing to bear our sin and to die in our place to shed his blood because he thought we were, in some sense, worth doing that for, to offer us the opportunity of repentance and the opportunity of being adopted into his family and coming into his kingdom. And so while humans are accounted as nothing as far as anything we want to try to do separate from God, you are still tremendously valuable in the sight of God. He says this in verse uh, 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. And so he ends up amazingly, after seven years of being out of his mind, being given his kingdom back, demonstrating that God is in control over the the nations of the world, and he gives it to even the lowliest of men. And so, wonderfully, God gives him the second chance. God gives him this opportunity to be restored after discipline. And I would love that to always be the case, but I want to let you know that that's not always the case. In Acts chapter 12, uh, King Herod is proclaiming to his people, speaking, and they end up saying that he has the voice of a God and not of a man. And it is in that moment, because he refuses to give glory to God, that he dies and his breath is taken away. And so, like, there's this king who also had this issue with pride that God ends up judging in that moment. Or thinking about Pharaoh in the Exodus account, that God knows which human hearts will one day respond in repentance and those which won't. And according to his will, he can still use them to accomplish his own means of blessing his people, blessing those who will repent, right, and and bringing about glory to his name. And so, while we don't know how many chances a person might get, And we don't know which people might respond in repentance someday. Because you might have thought about King Nebuchadnezzar if you were a a Jewish person living in exile. This guy's a jerk. I want to see God judge him. I want to see God destroy this guy's kingdom. Right? But we don't know who might one day repent. And so we can be like Daniel who gives friendly wisdom to those around us. To encourage them to break off from their sins by practicing righteousness and to show mercy to the oppressed, right? That we can give people the opportunity to respond to the good news of the gospel that Jesus is a mighty and powerful king who humbled himself, right? Became like a man and chose to experience the death, even the death of a cross so that he might make us rich, right? To experience mercy 
and forgiveness. That we don't know who's going to respond. Because we, prior to this, probably would have thought King Nebuchadnezzar is forever going to be set in his ways. And so he says in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And so even if we, perhaps reading this, think seven years of living out of your mind is harsh discipline from the Lord for a heart of pride, Nebuchadnezzar at the end of this experience is like, no, God was right in all of it. God is just in everything he did in my life. And that he is the one who is able to humble those who are proud. And so it's, it's fair warning for us, right, that it is better to humble ourselves than to be humbled. And there's still good news in that even experiencing the being humbled, there can be opportunity for restoration, for repentance, right? And that God can build up on a true and good foundation, a life that is found and grounded in him. And so all of this was done so that Nebuchadnezzar would know truth about who God was, who God is, how we as humans relate to God. And our God is one who is willing to show evidence so that we can know who he is. And there's many examples, the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke is written that you might know with certainty the things that you had been taught about Jesus. Or let's close on this verse from 1 John in which he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, chances are you might be aware of the gospel message that believing in the name of Jesus to save you can rescue and redeem you and give you eternal life. But the Apostle John, right, God himself wants you to experientially know this, that you can have confidence before the Lord, boldly go before his throne of grace, not because of what we've done or righteousness that we've attempted to practice, but because of what he has done for us, that we can know this. And I imagine throughout our walk as Christians, we will continue to experience things that further persuade us of this truth, that God shows us his mercy repeatedly and throughout all of our lives, and that we can know that mercy and then share it with others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are able to hopefully learn from our own failures and mistakes. That better yet, hopefully we're able to learn from the mistakes of others. And even better than that, hopefully we can learn from the examples throughout biblical history in which people make poor choices. And then through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we can see your reflection on their life in your word. Lord, please give us wisdom. Help us to know these truths without having to experience them in difficulty ourselves. And Lord, I thank you that throughout our lives, because of your faithfulness, your goodness, you're keeping your promises, that we can continue to experientially know how good you are to us, how merciful you are to us, how loving you are to us. Because oftentimes our own hearts can doubt that you would know us and love us. And yet you do. And so, Lord, please continue to prove yourselves, yourself to us today. That we would know that you truly know us, everything about us. Nothing is hidden in our hearts from you. And yet you still choose to love us nonetheless. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.